for your morning wake up. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Mindy's going to take the roll so we can get we can get started. Ada Anderson. She's there. You're muted, Ada. Yeah, if you if you guys can unmute when you when you speak that way, we'll have it on record since we're voting and everything today. Uh, Andrea Suhaka. She's in England. Yeah. Uh, Barbara Boyer. You mustn't be Bob Rocker. Present. Kerry Johnson. Here. Kathy Noon. Here. Chris Lynn. Good morning. Connie Ward. Don Perez. Here. Donna Mullins. Here. Oh, you're, you're back? Huh? You're back. <laughs> I know I'm she's in, in England. <laughs> I'm in London. Yeah. Wow. George oh, Teal. <laughs> Gretchen Lopez. She's here. I see her. Yeah. Yeah, I saw her come on too. Okay. Jim Dale. Here. Carrie Erickson. Here. Perla Geller. Bill Cernanik. Present. Sean Wood. Sherry Haight Vogel. Steve Conklin. Good morning. Tex Elam. Here. Tama Howald. Here. And Winshaw. Okay. Okay. We are going to have Sharon talk to us for a little bit. Hi, Sharon. Hello. Good morning. Thank you. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, I, I also uh, want to thank you all for uh, scheduling this this uh, meeting on relatively short notice, so I appreciate it. We're trying as often during the toward the end of our uh, fiscal year to reallocate money just uh, to ensure that we're spending all of our funds. Um, so with that, we uh, put it out there for our contractors to request to be able to request additional funds and reallocate them from some of the other providers that aren't able to spend all of their grant monies. Uh, and with that, we received requests from 15 providers. Um, the total was close to a million dollars in requests, but we had approximately uh, just under 700,000 available to reallocate. And so the funding subcommittee uh, met maybe last week or the week before, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, the funding subcommittee met and reviewed the requests and made those challenging uh, decisions of uh, deciding how to allocate those, those funds. You'll see from the attachment with your packet that there are some that are just reallocating monies within their existing programs. And so there's kind of a net, uh, net zero change to their contracts, but they're just wanting to move money uh, between services. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the funding subcommittee looked at the types of services, uh, requesting additional funds, those that have wait lists, those who have, um, uh, you know, a, a large number of people that they're able to serve with the with the additional funds requested, um, additional units of service and that sort of thing. And so they've made those recommendations that you see on the screen. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about uh, any of the recommendations uh, for those funds. Bill has his hand up. Yes, Bill. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. And uh, Don can always step in on, on some of these questions. Uh, for this, folks had to be an existing contractor as this is mostly um, a reallocation of some funds that weren't going to be spent by other uh, grantees in, in some of this. Um, and um, maybe you could go through uh, one or two or three examples. Um, 
why some of the additional um, money that was requested did not get allocated. And I'm just thinking of, um, uh, I understand the reallocation among the various different areas of service, but you have a couple there that maybe you could mention, maybe the Alzheimer's Association and maybe the Colorado Center for the Blind, uh, which put in for additional uh, mm -hmm. uh, requests, but did not receive any. So uh, those might be a couple to comment on. Sure. Um, so uh, some of the ones, again, that, that perhaps didn't um, receive monies, it was because they had received monies previously. So this is actually the second opportunity that some of these providers were able to request additional funds. Um, again, and we also look at the that hierarchy of need. Um, so making sure that our basic services are covered. Um, also defer, um, I see Kathy and uh, you're, you're, you're available not to put you on the spot, but uh, Dawn or Kathy, Carey, uh, Ada, any of you, if you have any other thoughts you want to share about how you uh, chose the services? I, I certainly can let Dawn go first, but one of the things, Phil, that we looked at was the money that was being returned came out of certain categories. So chore services was one that we had quite a bit come back from certain organizations. So in order to, to sort of stay with our original, what we value and what was needed, we tried to give that money to others that could do chore services. So does that make sense? Yes. So and I think I, I think as a group, we had um, looked and tried to look this time for real hands-on services. For instance, Brothers Redevelopment, we gave them 60,000 in chores, but we did not give them the 8,000 for information and assistance compensated. Um, I mean, that's a tough call, uh, but I think we are really looking for hands-on direct service uh, to older adults. Dawn, do you want to add anything? Uh, not at this time. It, that's exactly how our funding subcommittee went. So okay. um, do you want any more specific uh, information, Phil, or anyone uh, else? No, but I was uh, hesitating going directly to a vote without getting any kind of comments on uh, the, the mm -hmm. rationale for some of that so that we could be on record. I think Jim Dale might have had. Jim, did you have a question or comment? Yes, it, it was on a visiting nurse's uh, request for evidence-based uh, preventive services. I know it's, it's, it's a small amount. I was wondering why that wasn't given. Colorado Visiting Nurse Association, evidence-based disease prevention yeah. health promotion. Yeah, so the, they they did have a small request, and this uh, really they they uh, in their particular case they have sufficient funds to meet the the needs of their contract, and we're just looking to uh, sort of bring on um, a few additional um, clients that they'd be able to serve before the end of the year. Um, again, I think the funding subcommittee had to make some really tough decisions on um, the. You know, trying to abide by the six hundred eighty-six thousand that they had available, and they came down to the within a dollar of what was available, and so that unfortunately meant that some of the other providers, uh, even with their smaller requests, did not get um, their um, their request. Okay. So, well, so being, Jim, yeah. Jim, there were some that were not going to have enough money to get through their. Um, to get through the end of the year. So instead of giving someone additional money, we were trying to get those to at least be able to serve those that they originally had wanted to serve. So perhaps the cost went up or you know whatever it might've been, but there were some that were gonna run out of money. So we, we looked at first what type of service it was and then who, who was gonna make it to the end of the contract year and who wasn't, I think might be a good way to put it. Yeah. I, I guess guys, my, uh, you know, my, my backgrounds in public health and prevention. And so the title is um, stimulating to me and the amount of money was 
so small. So uh, I know how difficult it is to review all these contracts, but I just thought I should bring it up. And, and so the next time, if not this time, the next time that we have a potential for getting them to do evidence-based work as opposed to some other things that might be done. Uh, prevention is, is even much better than taking care of the people after they have a problem. That, you got to realize that's my background, my drive. And I think what, what you all are experiencing here is just a precursor of what it's going to be like um, next year when we have more significant funding cuts. It is going to be very, very difficult. And then the yep. following year, um, we're going to have to really make some hard decisions. And um, the funding subcommittee is going to need all of your support because it is not easy um, to, to make these decisions. And unless we get an infusion of money, which I'm hoping for, um, it's going to be really hard. Um. I tell you, excuse. I tell you, agreeing with that, that there are times that by the time we get through all this, I just feel like sitting down and crying oh. because it is so heart wrenching the decisions that we have to make. But, but we get through it, and I, I feel comfortable that we did the right thing. But it's still really tough. I know yeah. it's got to be tough, Ada, and I have so much respect for this funding. Um, committee because those are hard decisions you guys work really hard and I know you put a lot of thought um, and time into it um, Gretchen Lopez has a question Gretchen do you want to jump on she's having an audio issue so I think read it to it read it out oh, loud. okay here it is okay it says what does the GP after caregiver respite care and caregiver counseling training mean with Catholic Charities. Sure. Um, That's the grandparent. That is uh, the grandparent. Yes. Sorry, Don. Yep. That's yep. okay. Grandparent. Thank you, Don. I have a quick question too. What is screening? I think uh, I can't remember which. I just saw screening under there as the um, category, and I'm not familiar with that. Right. Yeah. So that is um, essentially screening clients as they come in to uh, assess what their needs are. Um, so uh, typically they, in the case of a SWIC, I believe, or senior support services and SWIC, uh, both, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the services, the, the clients come in, they get, uh, it, it's kind of Similar to counseling, they, they come in, they do an assessment, they find out what, um, what types of services that they're eligible for and try to connect them with those services. So it's kind of screening them for their needs. Yeah, that's, a, that's an older American Zach category, so. Um, Thank you for that, yeah. yeah. Bill's got his yeah. hand up. Uh, yes, I'm looking forward and um, Carrie and the Committee of the Whole can kind of Put this under consideration, but for the uh, Jayla's comments about with the next allocation periods, um, maybe having a um, committee of the whole discussion as to the prioritization or assistance in the prioritization so that uh, all of that, um, uh, I know it's not going to be uh, rote methodical, but uh, maybe to help uh, some of the pressure off the subcommittee and trying to make some of that. Uh, I think I think that's a good idea and reminding us because really the Older Americans Act prioritizes most of what we have to do, right? Because um, we have those must do's under the Older Americans Act and we have, so those, those are the things that we have to look at. But I think it's important to remind the committee what those are again. Um, I, the funding I, subcommittee lives yeah. that, but you all don't. And so I think that would be a good thing to do. You know, um, Phil, did I lose you guys? No, no you're there. You? I can't see anybody you? anymore. Okay, oh, there you are. <laughs> Phil, you read my mind. That's exactly what I was thinking. It, I believe, will be very helpful as a group, Jayla, for you to go through each of those categories, and we know what the priorities are as a group 
Um, and so maybe we can schedule that, I don't know, um, later in the month. We'll talk about, or later in the year. Or we'll later in the year, yeah. 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 Okay. I think that's a really good idea. Donna? has her hand up. I just want to say that I remember many years ago, um, we did work pretty hard on trying to prioritize, and we based the priorities on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> I don't know who else was around at that time, but I do remember that as a background. Yeah, we we did do that, and um, you know, so it, it, it and we still use that um, mm -hmm. uh, to talk about you know basic needs. But it, first, the Older Americans Act, and then from there, because there are a right. number of programs that come under the Older Americans Act, and when we're in a time of low funding, we really do have to prioritize. So I think that'll be a wonderful exercise. Mm -hmm. and, and really recommitting again, right? To what what is the most important, so hard. Because during COVID, we, we had more money than we've ever, ever, ever had in our entire, my entire career. Um, so. Carrie Johnson, do you have a question? I, I think we had some services, Carrie, that um, also came up during COVID. Some people are still asking for those. They may be lower priorities at this point in time now that we put COVID behind us. But, you know, I think all of us could rattle off that simple answer of food, transportation, housing, always being, you know, the primary concerns that we have on our mind. Absolutely. Kathy's got her hand up. So I was just going to say, I think the, the timeliness of this is good because as we, a, a little bit of, of what our committee had to discuss was, oh, wait a minute, are we under the old or the new um, needs? And, and, you know, what are our emphasis? Because, you know, we just did our four-year plan. We're thinking about all the things that the COSOA showed us and what our four-year plan is, but people this year, not so much in this, this what we just did, but in the earlier RFPs, they're operating under the old. So as we move into the new, um, sort of the new requirements and, and the revision of older Americans and all these things, I think that would be a great time to review that for all of us. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We'll make sure we get that on the agenda. Bob, you remind us too. <laughs> we also do have, the funding subcommittee does have written procedures for prioritization as well. So, and we're happy to, to share that. Okay. Well, are there any more questions or discussion items before we move on? Okay. So let's, um, what else do we, oh, did you, before we vote, Sharon, did you want to talk about Nimble? Um, or we need them one at a time, don't we? Yeah, I think that I have them as separate Those items. Separate, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay. So can we have a motion for um, the funding that we just viewed on attachment A? So I'll move to um, have the group uh, authorize the appropriations that were recommended by the funding subcommittee. Second. And I'll second that. Second. And then um, who is abstaining besides myself? I am Tex. I am Chris Lynn. Chris. I have to abstain as well because of a little help. So. <laughs> um, and who Do we else? Have enough, Mindy? Um, I got Bob. I got you, Carrie. Pearl is on the line too now. Pearl, do you have to abstain? I don't think um, Denver. Not on this one. Okay. She's not on this list. Yeah. Not on this All one. right. Sorry, I was late. I was on a wrong platform. <laughs> I was in Teams. It's okay. so hard to keep them all straight. It, yeah. Well, Mindy, do I have to abstain on this if I'm not on there? I don't um, think so. It, no. Yeah, you, you have to abstain if, if there's a service that you're getting funded. So even if it's not your service, but so in the case of Perla, INA is on the list. So Perla Ooh. would need to abstain okay. from voting on INA. Oh, okay. And, and Tex also, I am is abstaining. Okay. All Four. right, so the people I have abstaining are Bob Brocker, Carrie Erickson, Perla Geller, and Tex Elam. Am I missing somebody? Chris Lynn. Chris okay. is abstaining. So this is the side that Carrie has to abstain? 
because she gets a, a type of service that's in here, whether she oh. specifically was in it, Sharon just said, because she gets a service. Yeah. Okay. How many did you say we needed? Seven, Mindy? Yeah, we've got it. We've got okay, it. Good. Oh, good. good. All right. Of the voting members, is there anyone who opposes? Wonderful. So all in favor it is. Okay. <laughs> All right, now I'll turn it back to you, Sharon. Thank you. So the next item is related to nimble science. Uh, many of you um, are probably already familiar with, with nimble science, but for those that aren't, it's a mobile fall prevention program. Uh, they are a for-profit company that we uh, entered into a pilot program back in February of 2021. And uh, the goal was to reach 15,000 people initially, and they blew that out of the water. Um, and so, oh, I'm sorry, that was, that was 5,000 initially, and now we're at 21,000 since the pilot started in uh, February of 2021, which is um, certainly for the money has been, we've been able to reach a large number of older adults. Um, we have, um, uh, you know, conducted surveys to make sure that the people who are using them are also, um, you know, happy with using this type of program. Um, and we would like to be able to continue that program for another year at slightly less funding. And so this item is, is to approve renewal of that contract. Um, they would be able to reach another 9,400 uh, people with those funds. And um, the, the contract amount is for 662300 And they're going to be doing it in Spanish. And, uh, yes. That happened because of us. We are now the largest fall prevention program in the nation. So a question, how many of those 21,000 are actually using the system? Did they tell you that? We get reports. So yeah, we, yeah so we get dashboard reports every month. Uh, yeah, well, so now we get them, uh, yeah, pretty much every month we get a, a list of, of um, the, the number of users that have been able to sign on. And so the average usage, uh, Bob, just so you know, is around seven plus uh, seven uh, sessions for um, uh, the training, but they also have an educational component where people are able to access health-related information, and um, the average usage for that is about uh, 10, uh, 10 sessions, educational sessions per user. And, okay. and I can tell you from experience um, for, with a lot of people I know, they come in and out. So they get real excited, and they exercise, and then they Stop for a while, like my mom. Now she's back on nimble again. Um, <laughs> and, and so they, you know, it's like it's not an everyday thing sometimes for her, but she does come in and out of it. Um, which is I think there, is good. Is there so it sounds like they give us information on the times each, like an average 10 sessions or seven sessions each user mm -hmm. uses, but is there a number of the monthly log on out of the 2100 or 21,000, I wonder? Um, we can certainly request that. Um, we have gotten the lists of uh, all of the unique users that have signed on and their zip codes to confirm that they're within our region. Um, if, if requested, I'm sure we could um, get that level of detail as they are able to get us any Data, we data want. that we want. Yeah. I'd be They're interested. really excellent at getting data. That, um, okay. It'd be really nice to see. I mean, like you said, Jayla, people get excited and they sign on, but it'd be really, um, I think, nice to see how many are actually using it each month. Yeah. I think, I think there are some months that wax and wane, you know, just like all services. 
Yeah. Um, they kind of, there's some that are, as people are getting outside, maybe we see less or like you all traveling all over the world. You may not uh, uh, be doing your nimble exercises, but uh, uh, you know, a couple of months from now, you might go, oh, time to get back in the nimble. But wouldn't it be fun to see a monthly report and actually see, wow, 10,000 people did use it last yeah. month, yeah. even though 21,000 be- signed up. But if 10,000 yeah. using it, that's, um, that's significant. Yeah. That is significant. I would just also, um, uh, being an intermittent user, will say that the <laughs> exercises don't always require you to sign on. I mean, once you've done an exercise, you might be doing it without signing on because I don't always have my phone on the right level of the house. Oh, that's a good point, Phil. Okay. Any other questions or comments about Nimble? Nope. All right. Can we take, uh, or can we have a motion? to approve the funding, additional funding for Nimble. A motion to extend the uh, uh, service, Nimble service uh, with an additional, I think uh, it was mentioned 6,600 and to uh, continue the service. I'll I'll second that. What was the actual number though, funding number? Uh, 662,300. Oh, 662,000. Okay, wonderful. All right. Any opposed? All right. Then it sounds like we are unanimous. Everybody our... can vote on this one, right, Sharon? Yes. We can all vote on this one. So it, it looks like it's unanimously passed. Good okay. job, Nimble. Okay. What else you got for us, Sharon? There's one more item. So thank you. Um, this one is regarding the, the voucher program. So as many of you have heard, is it's been rebranded as the Choice Services Program that is run by our Aging and Disability Resource Center. And we have a transportation and an in-home voucher program. And so this is uh, this item is to approve the contractors uh, for next year. Uh, they're all uh, our existing contractors, but they have grown over the years. Uh, there's six in-home uh, service providers, and then there's three transportation providers. Mindy's got that up on the screen. Um, and uh, the, the year that we started contracting with these providers, we renew their contracts annually. We review them. Our uh, uh, the, the, the client assessments are done in-house, so it is an internal program um, as far as, you know, we are the ones who do the intake and the assessment for the, the clients, and then we make referrals to these fee-for-service providers for in-home and transportation services. And so uh, we have a budget, and just based on uh, how much we have available to um, to, to, to issue for those vouchers, whatever is um, unspent every month goes back into the pool and, and then we, we issue new vouchers to, um, uh, to new clients. So um, this is the list of providers and um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about any, any of them in particular, but they've essentially been vetted based on uh, we look at their, you know, make, uh, of course, making sure that they have the proper licensure, uh, the insurance. That they have the insurance, <laughs> um, and that they, uh, so in the case of the in-home uh, uh, providers, they're all uh, licensed with the Department of Health and uh, Environment, and we uh, also just make sure that they are, you know, that they have a good history, that they've got, um, you know, we review their management and that sort of thing. And so, um, so we do a lot of the upfront evaluation of each of these providers, and then we, we uh, have visited them on site as well. Okay. Donna has a question. And then after Donna, Phil. Um, I just wondered about Parker Personal Home Care, since it's 
they must be new to us. Are they a new organization? Yes, Donna, that they were actually brought on in March. So they are fairly new. Um, and they are based in, I believe, um, it's not in Parker, <laughs> despite the name. It, uh, I think they were in the Arvada, in Arvada. So part of the reasons for having the, the, the providers that we do is we look at what their service coverage area is. And Parker does have some presence in the um, Jefferson area where they have, uh, they can bring on providers in the um, Gilpin and the Evergreen area. Um, and so, uh, yes, they are new. Um, had a chance to visit with them and they're, they're really, um, they've been around for a long time. I really oh, was impressed. Okay. okay, thank we, you. We really have made an effort to try and get to the more rural areas of our region. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a challenge though. Sharon has met with, I can't tell you how many providers <laughs> and some, you know, some just don't want to do it. Good, thank you. Sure. Yes, Phil. And Sharon, um, maybe since this is the, the funds for the, the vouchers comes out of a pool, uh, can you make some comments about the, the pool? You did uh, indicate how it rolls over from month to month if there are vouchers that are unspent, but if any particular month ends up being using the entire pool, uh, what happens, and um, and then is the um, overall voucher pool adequate enough? Yes, um, that's a good question, Phil. Um, you know, we do have wait lists, obviously, in in home care services, so we're on, we're not able to uh, serve all the people that that request the service. Um, but when someone does uh, enroll in that program, they get uh, up to six months of, of, of service. So it does commit the funds for six months at a time, but then we redeem them monthly. So if, um, a, a, if a client passes away or moves, uh, moves elsewhere and no longer needs the service or the service was only needed temporarily, then uh, the voucher then is uncommitted, deobligated, and then goes back into the pool. And then somebody off the wait list would then be prior, you know, uh, receive the service. And we have a prioritization schedule for determining um, how those people on the wait list are served. Uh, similarly, with transportation, um, you know, people love that program. We, we have to, we do have to turn people away for transportation vouchers. Um, and I think Erica Dubray had, had done a presentation earlier that kind of spoke to the, the volume of demand for that program. And so Uber um, are, is just taken off. People love being able to schedule their own rides uh, through Uber. Um, Hop, skip, drive, we're doing um, less uh, rides with um, their capacity has been a little bit limited because they also serve the school districts as well with their uh, with their driver pool. Um, and then we took on care pool as a as a new ish provider. They just entered the Denver market um, a little bit more expensive and and what they charge for their for their trips. Um, but we have um, literally less than a dozen trips per month through using CarePool right now, but hoping to do more. And the answer is no about resources. There's not in-home health could use triple what we have, um, but it's what we have, right? And everybody wants more hours of service and that would be wonderful to give, but we don't have the money to do it. And in transportation, it's, uh, <laughs> it's unbelievable how we can't, keep pace, um, we just, the demand is so high and, and that's why it's so critical. I mean, now we have waiting lists um, and so critical to get new money so that we can continue to serve these folks. The stories are heart-wrenching when we have to turn people away for service. It's horrible. Um, I spend, I mean, a lot of our time now uh, as managers, our, our, we talk about how to keep our staff morale up because it's so difficult to hear these stories and not be able to provide service. Shayla, 
And Sharon, I have a question about, I guess, and I think I know the answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyways. So these agencies come in under Dr. Cog's program. Dr. Cog employees does the screening. I'm assuming Dr. Cog employees do the reporting. Does that seem fair to all those other smaller agencies that are going through the process of writing the grant, doing the reporting, doing their screening? Wouldn't it seem easier for some of the other home health care just to come under Dr. Cog's program too? I guess I'm wondering why we're doing some under your program and then other agencies have to apply on their own. Sure. Well, in the case of in-home care, you know, we, part of the reason we had to develop that program is because a lot of our contractors were uh, reducing um, or exited quit. completely. Yeah. They quit. When, when Colorado Visiting Nurse was our largest provider for in-home care service, and then they uh, decided to get out. We were in a bind uh, for what to do with um, several hundred clients that were relying on them for homemaker and personal care services. So we had to turn to these agencies to try to fill that gap. Um, similarly with transportation, there's just not enough uh, providers out there. So we had to look for um, other providers that could do more of an on-demand type of service um, because in the past, you know, you had to schedule a couple of weeks out to be able to schedule a ride. And then with, when we brought in Uber, um, we also had talked to Lyft at one time. And then fortunately with Hop, Skip, Drive, we were able to do more of those personal type trips. Um, we're doing uh, less of that now just because the demand is, it's just the popularity of that program is, is, is grown so quickly. Um, but it, it's really driven by trying to fill in the need um, and not having enough providers to do that. So these, these companies, as I mentioned, are fee for service. So the in-home providers have to accept our rate. We don't negotiate based on what their budget is or what they, you know, so they, they, they accept a, a set rate from Dr. Cobb. Um, with our transportation providers, we pay their market rate. Um, okay. Would it, I hope that answers the okay. question. It, I think it does. And I thought that was the question. And so would Dr. Cog be open to having other providers join in that pool? Because I, the reason I'm asking is I know in Douglas, we don't have any grant funded in-home health or not health, non-skilled um, yeah. personal care. Nobody wants to go through that. It's They don't have the staff to write the RFP, to do the reporting. I've heard that over and over again, and it seems like this would be a much easier option for them. Yeah, that, I mean, that is a possibility. Like in the case of Griswold on the list on the in-home, they are also the subcontractor for city and county of Broomfield, but we're also contracting with them. So there are advantages to having certain, you know, some of our contractors be the pass-through entity for that. And there's, there might be other situations where it makes sense for us to be the ones to manage that. So um, I just worry too about the workload on Dr. Cog's staff as well. Well, I know that you hard. know, one thing about this is that it's, I feel really, I feel a lot of comfort with this program under Dr. Cog's staff, just because we do the assessments and we monitor regularly what's going on. And so um, that wasn't always the case with some of our contractors in the past. Um, and I, I know that people are getting service. Um, we're not getting complaints about, you know, folks not showing up and um, so that that is important. I like kind of, you know, like Carrie, if you wanted to be the pass through in Douglas County for something like this, that could be something where you monitor, but I don't know if you want to do that. But yeah, this is why, unfortunately, I mean, yeah, we want providers that will serve this whole region. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have enough money. You're just going to get put people on a waiting list right now um, because we don't have enough money to serve what we have. Um, which is unfortunate. 
Um, Cause this program is the program. This and transportation are the programs that keep people out of nursing homes and, and, and higher level care. 100%. And you know, how awful is it that because you can't shower, and because you can't get to the grocery store or the doctor's appointment, you have to go into assisted living or a nursing home. That should not be the reason why you go into a high level of care. I agree, Jayla. No, yeah, I, I know you do. I got, I'm getting on my soapbox here. Sorry. Well, um. no, and I, I think it's good for the group to hear all of that too. But I do have one other question, and I'm sorry I'm taking so long, but I had called care pool myself to try and get services in Douglas County and the prices were astronomical. So I'm curious. I, I we all want to and I, you guys have probably already looked at this because you're on top of things 100%. But I was very surprised at their pricing and I, I would not use them myself. Maybe that's because I'm in a more rural county. Mm -hmm. Could we speak yeah. to that the sub the funding subcommittee? Anybody? I don't know that they would necessarily be, uh, you know, we, we didn't discuss their pricing. They, they actually came back to us because they wanted more for their um, accessible type trips and it was above what we were willing to pay. And I'm not sure if that's part of what you were looking to have, Carrie, but it was it was way more than what we could um, pay them for the um, ADA type trips. That's one of the challenges is they'll, you know, providers contract with us for one rate and then later in the year come back and say, oh, we need more money. And you're like, oh, um, it's hard um, to, to be just, able to do that. And I don't doubt that they need more money. And we wanted, careful, we wanted them because they were couch to couch, right? At more frail, more um could provide that accessibility and unfortunately we're just not there yet with them you're right okay yeah. they're very new and they're still trying to get their feelers out for the market what what the market will bear for their so service. they're really not on this did i know uh, they are um but we're doing very few rides with them right now um, it's very that's what the staff do is they help select what provider is going to be able okay. to do. It's kind of mobility management, right? Okay. So they, they listen to what the person needs. And let's say we have people who have lots of different needs. So I need to go to the grocery store. I need to, you know, go to the doctor's appointment, but I also want to go to church. And so um, the staff will set up different kinds of rides for those people. And sometimes we just get bus passes, right? Um, to For folks that, that have access for bus. And so that's what we're trying to do in the voucher program is manage those rides a little bit better so that we're not using the most costly service. And then we're also going to do travel training. Hopefully it'll start this year um, so that, that we can help people use the lower cost services more effectively. Um, because that's, I mean, that's the only way we're going to make this in increase. Um, you know, be able to serve more people. Thank you, Jayla. Tex has a question and then Carrie. Well, just that it is interesting that we have in this case, and I'll just stay with transportation, a dual system. And the issue was brought up a little earlier about Dr. Cog versus other ways of, of uh, getting the vouchers. That might be an interesting thing to look into, but I think the whole program is, is as one who not only uses it, <laughs> but also is involved in several groups that are associated with it. It's a wonderful program by itself. Yeah, we're hoping to expand the vouchers and be able to use those you know, or give vouchers to other organizations so they could use them, but the we just don't have the money. I mean, we just don't have it. We got to figure out how to manage what we have. And it's not, <laughs> it's overwhelming. Um, we're still, remember, with all of our contractor providers, VIA and the rest, turning a thousand people, thousand people each month away who have requested transportation services. That's now. And, and next year, we're talking about funding cuts. 
Mm -hmm. That's scary. Carrie, did you have something? Well, I just wanted to uh, mention that we did talk about the higher cost of that service, and it was a concern for the planning committee. Uh, but then Sharon, you know, explained what she just did to this group as well, and how high the need is, and it seemed uh, it seemed reasonable to approve that. Okay, thank you. But we did give them. It's just a contract. Yeah. Does is there any more questions that we need to discuss about this? Okay, I don't, does anybody have to abstain from this? I don't think so. I do. Oh, text. Text. So, yeah, text, that's right. That's right, okay. All right, can we have a motion to approve the additional funds for the voucher program? Uh, Carrie, is it additional funds or just an endorsement of the organization? That is a good question, Phil. I thought, was there not additional funding, Sharon? No, it, it's just a contract with these providers for another year. Thank you, Phil. Okay, thanks, Sharon. All right, do we have a motion for that? I to endorse the list as provided. Okay. Second? Anyone? I'll second. Okay. Anyone opposed? All right, we unanimously pass that as well. Great, good. And Carrie, if I may, I just want to recognize again the funding subcommittee because you know they, uh, I you know it's just a, 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 such a tremendous group of people led by our fearless leader Don Perez, who you know I just really appreciate so much for keeping us on track and organized and coordinated and just uh, all of the thoughtful. Uh, the thoughtfulness and the 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 time commitment and and um, and the really advice. hard decisions. Um, so uh, that would be Don Perez, Ada Anderson, Carrie Johnson, Kathy Noon, and Perla Gaylor. So I, I really appreciate all of them and um, just want to recognize them again for for all of their help. <laughs> you guys are fabulous. We have gone over. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Phil, Very, you, yes, I, I just want to mention uh, two items, uh, if I could, and I'll be brief okay. for a change. Um, one is yesterday with uh, Commissioner Teal um, had a chance to make a presentation at a groundbreaking where a builder and a land developer in Douglas County is donating a home to a disabled veteran. Uh, and the home is going to be built with universal design. And uh, he's a four-tour uh, four veteran of Afghanistan who is a disabled veteran. Uh, he has a, a prosthetic leg that he uses. Uh, I had a chance to uh, talk with him because he's also a, a self-proclaimed avid cyclist. So uh, that was, a, that was a, a fun event uh, to have. And it's kind of nice. Um, to see all of that. And um, just a, a note for a future agenda, this is the second item, um, with the uh, property tax, et cetera, all of that components in this, um, that was uh, a light item from the legislature, but it's gonna be a ballot item for the fall. Um, we should uh, have Rich and whoever else Rich would like to explain it because it's very complicated just in my reading between short-term, long-term incentives uh, or uh, paybacks or whatever. And uh, I just want to make sure. Yeah, Phil, is that I would also like, I'd also like to get some specific language for older adults. Mm -hmm. um, if we, it, that's so important because I mean, it's come up on COSO as one of the top needs is paying property taxes. So we yeah, can I, get I, that on the agenda. Yeah, we can well. get that on. I don't know if the language for the ballot measure is still going to be up to discussion, but uh, it's, it's, they've complicated it. I don't know how they got by the single topic rule in the legislature and whether that's going to be challenged or not but uh, 
we should get some briefing on it, I think. Okay. Okay. Well, we will do that. And thank you all for jumping on today. Thank you again, funding subcommittee. And I release everyone. We're already <laughs> over. Okay. I have to come in. All right. All right. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> yes, Jayla. Thank you. Okay.